Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad that you've decided to join us. I hope you've done it before. For those of you who have come, come regularly, you know that this is a study about this, the Adventist uh, Sabbath School lessons, which are prepared by the General Conference. And this is lesson number seven in a series entitled Witnessing and Evangelism. And this particular lesson is focusing on corporate evangelism and witnessing how the church members can work together as a group to try to promote evangelism in, in their church organization. And before we begin, let, we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we, for a word of prayer. Our loving Father, it's a great privilege to serve you. We know that the good news is always about you. It's not about us. It's not even about the church. The good news is about you. And help us to understand that and to show that in our lives and in our words. Now as we study this subject, may we present it in ways that are meaningful to those who listen is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you think it's God's plan that church members should work together to evangelize and witness? There are many New Testament examples of, of that. When Jesus sent people out, how did he send them out? Two by two. Two by two. He did that first with his 12 disciples in Galilee after he'd been with them for a while. He said, no, no, you go out and you do it. You try it. Two by two. Go here and there and there. They came back and they were so excited about what had happened. And then later when he was down in Perea, he sent out 72. We have no idea who those other 60 people were, uh, but apparently there were other disciples whose names we don't, have, we don't know. Uh, and, 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 and he sent them out two by two to witness. So apparently that's an intentional part of God's plan for us to work together, maybe in small groups, two by two, or a little bit larger groups, um, within the church structure. She uh, says that in evangelism, calling out the 12 about him, Jesus bade them go out two by two through the towns and villages. None were sent alone, but brother was associated with brother, friend with friend. Thus they could help encourage each other, counsel and pray together, each one's strength supplementing the other's weakness. Very good. Reference again? Uh, Desire of Ages, page 350. Okay. And evangelism, page 72, it looks like. Mm -hmm. Well, what about your church? Do you have recognized witnessing leaders in the church who have actually done it? And are, are, are someone other than the pastor, perhaps, who is actually doing something and, and, and maybe is willing to lead others and show them how to do it? Um, now, we, the traditional Adventists, there are two traditional things that Adventists have done. One is the big evangelistic campaigns. Um, at one time in, in, in back in Ellen White's day, we owned, the, we owned the biggest, Adventists owned the biggest tents in the entire United States. It was a big attraction in those days. When there were no television, no radio, no, no phonographs, nothing else like this. Someone comes into town and puts up a big tent. Well, everybody wants to know what the deal is, you all right? So it was a huge attraction. And the other way which we have witnessed traditionally is, so I go with my Bible, I go into somebody's house, and I hold Bible studies for them in their homes. But there are probably other options. What other options might there be? And or is there, are there new takes on, I mean, I, I think if you went down to most of the towns in America now and put up a big tent, they would be inclined to say, what are you selling? You know, or, or you know, they'd probably out to the city council and say, can we get this thing out of here, you know, something like that. It, it, I think that day of big tents is probably gone, but what, what is effective in our day? Well, some people put together singing groups. Mm -hmm. Some people even put together clubs, like mm -hmm. bicycle clubs that are centered around Christianity. Mm -hmm. there's, there's all kinds of things, just depending on the interest. It seems like the interest would... would gather certain types of people together. Okay. Some of the young medical students here are putting on a uh, series with a speaker, Bradshaw I think it is, uh, with a cooking class, series of cooking classes and some kind of health fair. Mm -hmm. 
and they're doing that for the students who um, just for the whole for the whole campus. And there are a number of students that attend the university here who are not Adventists, mm -hmm. and that's a good, a great opportunity for the Adventist students to witness. Yeah. Well, we know from the Bible, if you look at Acts 13, uh, a, a few verses there and a little bit in chapter 14, that Paul always traveled with who? Other friends, and they witnessed together. Paul started out with Barnabas back in the beginning and with John Mark, and you remember John Mark turned back. That's, um, that's Acts 13, 13. Um, and if you drop down to Acts 13, 50, verse 50, you... Um, you see that um, the Jews stirred up the leading men of the city and the Gentile women of high social standing who worshiped God. They started persecution uh, against Paul and Barnabas and threw them out of their region. So, you know, you win some, you lose some. And we know that something else happened. Uh, Paul and Barnabas went to the synagogue. They spoke in such a way that a great number of Jews and Gentiles became believers. So Paul's methodology was go to a new city, Go to the synagogue, wait till somebody recognizes you and say, do you have anything to say? Oh, sure, I got something to say. So he would stand up and he would preach and tell, you know, and some of the Jews would be convinced to become Christians and others would throw them out. Then you go on to the next town after he'd worked with those Jews for a while. What would be the equivalent today of Paul going to the uh, synagogue? That's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. What do you think? Where, I'm going to be like Paul. Where do I go? Who are the Gentiles? Am I going to go out on the what, what, front of the Catholic Church on Sunday morning and let them have it? No, 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 no. This but was uh, Paul and Barnabas, were they supported by the church main body? Or was the, Paul a pastor of his own church? No. Or the church laid their hands on him and said, God bless you, go. You know, Paul, I mean, we like to talk about Paul, good old Paul, but... You know, it, the picture is, he went out there and he, he wasn't so much a pastor, he was a preacher. Mm -hmm. he, he, he'd done the preaching. Yeah, and something is interesting there. What happened to Paul and Barnabas, by the way? They split. split. They split over, over, the next time they were ready to go out, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark again, and Paul said what? That's true. Your life. No way. Well, I'm talking about that young man. He turned back. He was a quitter last time. We're not taking him with us. Does God, this is, a, this is a strange question to ask, but does God ever cause up, stir up a little controversy in some evangelistic teams who are doing well so that they split and now you've got two teams instead of one? <laughs> or does the devil cause controversy between the members of the team and God uses that in spite of the devil? Okay. Some good. I like that one. <laughs> Very good. Well, again, coming back to our day and what we could do, um, would we dare to go to a Sunday church? We just had an APC reunion a couple of weeks ago and had a class reunion. One of my classmates, who among his many evangelistic efforts, he teaches a Sunday school class. Mm. There you go. I know a couple who went to Sunday school and they said, how are they supposed to know but that we don't go and um, participate in their Sunday school class? So I figured they went to church two days a week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We go all out and we, you know, we kill ourselves trying to earn a living. How much effort do we put into trying to win souls for eternity? Well, in terms of, of the idea of, of getting together, there's an interesting passage in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting with verse 9. It goes like this. Two are better off than one, because together they can work more effectively. If one of them falls down, the other one can help him up. But if someone is alone and falls, it's just too bad, because there's no one to help him. If it is cold, two can sleep together and stay warm, but how can you keep warm by yourself? Two people can resist an attack that would defeat one person alone. A rope made of three cords is hard to break. So, I mean, you know, that, these are sort of obvious things. But um, what about that? Uh, do we dare? Yes, Dennis. Last time I was in San Francisco, mm -hmm. 
I remember standing waiting for the cable car at the corner of Powell and Market. Oh boy. Pouring rain. Uh -huh. um, standing under an umbrella. And there was a, a young man, maybe 30, a uh, bit overweight, in shorts and a hat, shouting at the top of his voice something about Jesus is Lord and just had, uh, had three sentences he just kept he repeating. Just, just, just kept repeating. Um, I, I wonder how effective that sort of witness is. Mm. Probably not very. So yeah. what should we do? <laughs> well, we're talking now about getting together as teams, and maybe the second person in your team would get tired of that pretty quick, too. I imagine so. Well, it depends on the person. You might find a couple that might <laughs> do that forever. Well, maybe, maybe you are supposed to go out in teams to keep each other from doing something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, well, I could take a, a half a dozen uh, paperback uh, Desire of Ages or Steps mm -hmm. to Christ and go knocking door to door. Uh, it's, would, would that? Well, that's a that's, possibility. That's almost against the law anymore. Yeah. Well, look at Paul's example. Again, <laughs> it, it's, fun to, it's fun to look at biblical examples. <clears throat> On his second trip, he started out with Silas. They got to Iconium, and there was a young man by the name of Timothy. And Timothy says, I, I would like to join him. Paul says, yeah. Uh, your father was Greek and your mother was Jewish. Maybe we better circumcise you because we're going to synagogues. So he circumcised him and off they went. And a little while later, they found themselves in Philippi. And they were arrested. Remember the story of the young lady? We don't need to go on to the details there. But they were arrested and thrown into prison. Well, first, I guess we, we should back up. What did they do? What was the first thing they did when they got over to Europe? in Philippi. They hadn't been to Europe before. They're in Philippi. What did they do? Do you remember? First place they did was, always, was go to the place where the Jews were. Okay. And talk to them. Well, in this city, as far as they could tell, there was no synagogue. So now what are you going to do? Find out where the meeting place is. And this time it was on the riverbank, wasn't the it? The riverbank. They went down there. But it wasn't Jews she ta they talked to. They found a woman down there. You know exactly why she was down there, maybe washing her clothes or whatever. They started talking to her and convinced her to become a Christian. And what did she do? She just come home. She, it turns out she was a wealthy businesswoman. She says, bring your whole team over. You can stay at my house while you're here in town. Okay, now here's Timothy who's joined up. Now here's a woman who's providing shelter and food. Are they part of the evangelistic team? Sure. Of course. So you don't have to be the preacher. You're not the one that does all the talking to be a part of the evangelistic team. And then the Paul and Silas got arrested and thrown into prison over that casting a demon out of that young lady. And in the middle of that there was the earthquake. And the jailer was, thought he should, he should kill himself and Paul says, no, don't. And then he took Paul and Silas home and said, man, what do we have to do to be saved? And he's cleaning them up, and he's feeding them, and he's taking care of them. Do you think he became a part of the evangelistic team? I'm just asking. Wouldn't that qualify? So what are you saying? Well, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying here is that not everybody who, who joins an evangelistic team is, is, it needs to be the preacher. There are lots of things you can do. Maybe your job is to put out the chairs or, or, or take up the offering or whatever. Dennis? A book that I read recently that I've alluded to from time to time discusses that issue and suggests that only one in ten of the church membership really need to be on the front line doing the quote evangelism. The others are support people are, are some that, that shepherd the flock, that are support for the church. But the whole church needs to get together mm -hmm. and work together to support each other in the roles that each play. There's a very interesting statement in the Seventh-day Adventist Church Manual that I don't think many Adventists have ever heard about. 
It states that one of the chief concerns of the church board is the work of planning and fostering evangelism in all its phases. Is it clear in your church that the church board is focusing on that as one of its main projects? What kind of training programs are being sponsored to prepare people to witness? Don't everybody talk at once. We're trying to think of an example. Yeah, exactly. Well, you got to kind of put a picture together so we can see the circumstances, so we can come up with something. Okay. So, <laughs> well, you you put together a program. You you're going to have to get people to come. Yep. They're going to have to have some kind of a desire to and participate. And how, how, there's two aspects of, at least two aspects of that. I would limit it to two. But you're going to have to get some people who, are, who have friends that they're willing to invite, or at least people who are willing to go out and, and to the general public and put out invitations, whether it's mailing them out or putting them on people's doors or whatever. And then there's got to be people who help them. Find, maybe You might be someone who says, well, you know, I'd like to come to those meetings, but I don't have transportation. Okay, I'll bring you. I remember once... You know, I, I started working in Pathfinders when I was in college. Mm -hmm. There was only five kids there the whole time. I said, there's got to be a way to get more people there, more kids. And so I got this great idea. I was going to bring Bugs Bunny films in. Mm -hmm. And I started playing these Bug, B Bugs Bunny films. And um, all of a sudden, we had 60 kids. <laughs> and, um, and I got called in by, by the leader and said, you know, you're just baiting those kids to come here. And it just came into my mind. I said, well, aren't we supposed to be fishers and men? <laughs> and it was kind of, but anyway. Sounds like what a young person might say. Yeah, well, well that's true. But <laughs> it, there, there's, there's probably ways of getting people to come to these things, but you have to kind of think out of the box. Well, that was great because they were there for Bugs Bunny, but then they got the other stuff too. Well, yeah, and we had a full good. program, and mm -hmm. they came back. Even mm -hmm. they probably would have come anyway. But Dennis, I visited a church uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, and they they had a brochure, uh, several pages long, kind of uh, tall and narrow shaped, listing the various groups or clubs that the church sponsored. They had a cycling club. They had a book club. They had a, uh, a law club. They, they, wow. you know, they, they had about a dozen different clubs that were organized by the church that met at least once a month, not, if not more often. And in this book that I've, I keep mentioning, you know, these are the various things that, that were suggested as, as a method of evangelism uh, citing uh, some statistics that uh, had been <coughs> generated that a person needs five favorable contacts with uh, Adventists before they will accept an invitation mm -hmm. uh, to come to church or to attend an evangelistic series. And, and you provide the opportunity for those interactions, those five, five uh, interactions, with with uh, health clinics, with stop smoking clinics, with bicycling clubs uh, that are not limited to just the in crowd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, Paul had a problem with a church. The name of the church was Corinth back in those days. And they had written to him, what about this business of speaking in tongues? And we don't have time to talk about the whole picture, but in in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, he talks about the different kinds of gifts that God gives. And then he mentions, he has that incredible chapter 13, where he talks about the most important way to get to make progress of the gospel is love, the agape kind of love. But then he goes on in chapter 14 and says, but you know, you're speaking in tongues there in Corinth, and what you're doing is, well, he says, I do speak in tongues myself, uh, maybe more than any of you. Uh, and I don't forbid that, but, you know, it would really be better to speak five words with my understanding than a thousand words in these tongues, so forth. And then he ends up with this conclusion, 
1 Corinthians 14, starting with verse 39. So then, my brothers and sisters, set your hearts on proclaiming God's message, but do not forbid the speaking in strange tongues. Everything must be done in a proper and orderly way. Would you, you decipher what? that? Uh, <laughs> what? Would you decipher that? What's, what's he saying? Well, I think what he's saying is, if you're going to if you're going to run a, a church program, you just give a perfect example. Here was a church who had figured things out. They sat down. They thought it through. It was done properly and orderly. Here's a club for this. Here's a club for that. And I mean, it, but but it, what he's saying is, you can't have a, a, a church and one person's going this direction, somebody else going that direction, somebody else going that direction, and nobody's working together, and that's not going to work. Do you think his topic there is glossolalia as we think of it today? Or was he talking about somebody speaking in their native language to a people no. who were not of their of their He was talking about people who came from Corinth, probably lived all their lives in Corinth, and they were they were speaking in if you want to use the technical term glossolalia. And because it, it can't be it can't be the kind of speaking in tongues we have in Acts 2 because it says right over there, we've all heard him in our own language and we understand it. So this can't be the same kind of stuff. But the, the point of, of, of mentioning that is the question of, of organization. Um, you know, evangelism isn't just, oh, I guess I'll go out and give a Bible study tonight. You know, you, you, you need to have a, a plan. You need to think this through. And Jesus gave a perfect example of that uh, when, he, when he was picking out his, his disciples. Just pick a, a, a place. Look at Mark 3, verses 16 to 19. These are the 12 he chose, and if you go back, you'll find out that he spent the whole night, the entire night, before he chose these 12, praying to his Father. And I'm sure they were planning on how they were going to work with these, these people. These are the 12 he chose, and then there's Simon. Jesus gave him the name Peter. James and his brother John, sons of Zebedee. Jesus gave them the name Boanerges, which means men of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, and Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus. Thaddeus, Simon the Patriot, and Judas, who betrayed Jesus. And here's, here's Jesus with God's direction ending up with a betrayer in the middle of his core group. That prophecy might be fulfilled. <laughs> that prophecy might be fulfilled. But he, he did give some evidence that he wasn't surprised by this. No. Because mm -hmm. um, I don't think he really wanted him in the first place. Mm -hmm. The disciples pushed it on. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in corporate evangelism, the Adventists are, are just going gangbusters with corporate television evangelism where churches have got together and they're supporting and then they're showing certain things in their churches. And also churches can um, sponsor a radio station mm -hmm. where it just low level, it goes to their area. And those are wonderful ways mm -hmm. to evangelize. I mean, you don't have to pull everybody into your physical church. Yeah. But, um, and the internet, to start a website, like there's a ministry from a, um, a church and they have a website for people who want to uh, talk about their drug problems and get off drugs and that sort of thing. And they will communicate by email with the mm -hmm. person and uh, help them along the way. And, and just anything that your church can do like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then it takes also- organization. Yeah, and then also supporting the large um, television stations and radio stations, Adventist World Radio and all that. I mean, mm -hmm. these are wonderful corporate ways. By contrast, how many of us have been part of churches where there was squabbling going on? How much time in your church, let me speak to you as our audience, how much time in your church in the last year has been spent on planning evangelistic programs and outreach programs versus how much time has been spent on fighting over who's going to be the next church elder, fighting over what kind of music should be in church, fighting over any number of things, how the church Sabbath school order should be done and so forth like this. There's so many distractions that can can just take up time and, and split churches. And I don't I think probably everybody's heard of examples of churches that have split over relatively minor issues. 
but they seemed like great big issues at the time. But I, I suspect that if, and, and, and Paul talks about this, we'll go there in just a moment, I suspect that if the church were really focused on outreach and bringing people into the church, those minor issues would just fade. Should we deal with and get rid of those minor problems, solve them before we evangelize? I those suspect quote, if we problems? made that as our goal, the devil would, just as fast as we got rid of one problem, he'd feed another one into the church. He would find a way to keep an unending list of problems going in the church. So the church is still a hospital for sinners. It's still a hospital for sinners. Not a museum of saints? No, not. You know, a lot of people uh, in the church, they spend a lot of times arguing about <coughs> doctrines, creation, you know, and women's ordination, and, and they're just burning their wheels up and time up mm -hmm. with all this stuff. And um, new people can walk by and they won't even notice because they're all into themselves. Um, and yeah. is that what you're talking about in squabbling and burning up time and effort? Yes, and time and effort, which we should be using to, to evangelize. And then a new person comes in, and if the church has allowed this uproar, uh, the new person wonders, well, this is your doctrine, and, and this is the people I meet that yeah. they don't match, and uh, they just walk out the door again. Well, but the, the problem is, is that you see, is that the music is, is attracting the wrong kind of people. The church is <laughs> growing, but we're getting the wrong kind of people in here. <laughs> and, okay. and so... Yeah, and how do we get those, and those it's, out to you know, kind of push them off? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, so, it's so we get corrupting the, wrong... the church. And they're wanting to do these plays and drama and all that stuff. Oh, and it's attracting the wrong, you know, so... <laughs> how do you... <laughs> Who's, who's you, right you're here? Almost, you're almost got your tongue stuck between your teeth there, <laughs> tongue in cheek. <laughs> so pa Paul said this. <laughs> see, 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 see how this fits. Philippians 1, and I'm going to start with verse 3. I thank my God for you every time I think of you. And every time I pray for you all, I pray with joy. And <clears throat> Paul is doing this while he's in prison in Rome. Okay. I pray with joy because of the way in which you have helped me in the work of the gospel from the very first day until now. He's writing to the Philippian church. And so I am sure that God, who began this good work in you, will carry it on until it is finished on the day of Christ Jesus. You are always in my heart, and so it is only right for me to feel as I do about you. For you have all shared with me in this privilege that God has given me, both now that I am in prison and also while I was free to defend the gospel and establish it firmly. God is my witness that I am telling the truth when I say that my deep feeling for you all comes from the heart of Christ Jesus himself. I pray that your love will keep on growing more and more together with true knowledge and perfect judgment so that you will be able to choose what is best. Then you will be free from all impurity and blame on the day of Christ. Your lives will be filled with the truly good qualities which only Jesus Christ can produce for the glory and praise of God. And then he talks about the more practical issues. I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, that the things that have happened to me have really helped the progress of the gospel. Paul being thrown into prison has really helped the progress of the gospel. Well, as a result, the whole palace guard, talking about an unfriendly evangelism setting, and all the others here know that I'm in prison because I'm a servant of Christ. And my being in prison has given most of the brothers and sisters more confidence in the Lord so that they grow bolder all the time to preach the message fearlessly. Of course, some of them, now these apparently are preach, these are apparently are supposedly Christians, some of them preach Christ because they are jealous and quarrelsome, but others from genuine goodwill. Now, how do you preach Christ because you're jealous and quarrelsome? What was he talking about? Might be a person who likes the sound of their own voice. Okay, and what, would they, what might they be doing? Um, something else besides showing Christ. Mm -hmm. well, what about, uh, what about um, uh, some Jewish? I mean, Paul is dealing with synagogues and, mm -hmm. some, and certainly some members of the Jewish faith. What is there? So I'm just trying to answer your question, what might be a possible scenario? What if somebody is just... Uh, 
you know, they're they're tired of being strapped into this Jewish culture or, or whatever it is, and and they're dragging this Christian stuff in there just to be divisive. Mm -hmm. uh, am I am I painting kind of a picture that I yeah, see in my that's mind? That's plausible. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what Paul might be. Th those are funny w terms, and the way he's got yeah. those structures, they have some kind of an idea. And You're suggesting mm -hmm. maybe some people who have at least a leaning toward Christianity might have be Jews who are attending the synagogue, and they're there raising questions about Jesus and about why he's here and so forth like this, and, and they're actually raising questions in people's minds about Christianity, but to someone looking on, you might think, these people are just stirring up a mess, just stirring up a fight. Maybe just to bring uh, contempt upon the group of Christians mm -hmm. to sabotage what was going on. Could he be yeah. talking about the the people uh, that were that was following him, as far as you know, coming after him and kind of redoing things, undoing things again? You think that they were spreading the gospel? He said these people, by being quarrelsome, are actually promoting the gospel. Could he be talking about the Judaizers? Yeah, that's where I was going to go. What about that? Well, well, they're spreading the gospel, but not the exact... They were Christians. Mm -hmm. Claimed to be anyway. Claimed to be Christians. And, and so they had their version of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And they might have been preaching because I'm of Apollo, I'm of Paul, or I'm of somebody else. And there were these these cliques within, within the church or... And the preachers of those might be doing it for their own good. Uh, but what you're saying, maybe, maybe at least some people might l have looked on that kind of situation and said, hmm, who's got the truth here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, let me, let me go home and, and, and check this out. Let me talk to somebody else. Let me find out what, what's going on here. Mm -hmm. is, this, is there any shades of this in that story when oh, there were people out in Jesus' day healing in the name of Jesus or preaching mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus and they weren't really quite uh, uh, as doctrinally correct and mm -hmm. and some of the disciples thought you know this shouldn't be but Jesus said you know there there is some mm -hmm. yeah. there is some some end result here that is has some merit well one of the problems here is that as Paul discusses frequently in his letters and some of the others do as well often we have more trouble getting along with the other church members than we do maybe with the people out in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, in, in Paul's day, there was this huge divide between those who had been Jews and many of whom thought that, that every Christian should be a Jew first and then you can be a Christian, and those who came directly into Christianity from, from even paganism, from non-Jewish backgrounds, and they thought, you know, following Paul's example that, you know, you can be a, a great Christian without having to be circumcised, without having to follow all these Jewish traditions and so forth. So that became a, well, and, and you read Galatians, read Romans and so forth, you'll see that this became a contentious point again and again. Corinthians, yeah. Um, they had a whole general conference back in Acts 15 over the issue, do we dare to let these Gentiles into the church? Um, so maybe a contentious issue might lead some people to, in our day, pick up their Bibles. It wasn't so easy to do in Paul's day. What, what, what's the truth here? What's going on here? That's a possibility. Paul clearly says, and, and, and some of the other disciples as well, that church members are expected to love each other. They're expected to forgive each other, even to pray for one another. Uh, look at John 15, 12, and Ephesians 4, 32, and James 5, 16. And if you, if you actually have an a electronic concordance of some kind, have fun sometime and just look up the words one another in the New Testament and see how many passages talk about how we're supposed to relate to each other. It's a very interesting I, exercise. I prefer to stick more to this, to the doctrinal side of stuff as opposed to this brotherly love. I see. Yeah, that brotherly love stuff. You don't is have tough, to get right? so involved with the doctrinal right. stuff. That's I see. Brotherly love. It's you've got to be patient with your. Well, Paul clearly spells out what he thinks the goal of all this is. It's found in Ephesians four, and I'm going to start with verse nine. 
Now, remember, he's been talking about how Jesus came down and went back up and so forth. Uh, now, what does he mean he went, what does he went up mean? It means that first he came down to the lowest depths of the earth. And that, of course, he's talking about Jesus. So the one who came down is the same one who went up above and beyond the heavens to fill the whole universe with his presence. It was he who gave gifts. We've talked a little bit about the gifts. He appointed some to be apostles. And another word for apostles is missionaries. Others to be prophets. Those, those would be ambassadors, people who speak for God. Others to be evangelists. That's what we're talking about this whole series. Others to be pastors and teachers. He did this to prepare all God's people. Now here's, here's what we're supposed to do. He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. And so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer be children carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ, who is the head. Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together, and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. Now, when you read that, I hope you have a question arise in your mind about another passage that Jesus himself mentions in Matthew 18. Paul says we, we shouldn't be children any longer. We need to grow up. We need a mature church that all works together. But what about this passage from Jesus in Matthew 18? At that time, the disciples came to Jesus asking, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So Jesus called a child, made him stand in front of them, and said, I assure you that unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who humbles himself and becomes like this child. Now, isn't that a direct contradiction? No. How do I fit those two together? That mature person who has the knowledge also has the understanding that there's a whole lot more that God can give them mm -hmm. and isn't pounding it over and saying how much I've got, but in humble gratitude and gratefulness to God says, I want more. Okay. What do you think Jesus meant when he said we should be like children? Children can be very gullible. I don't they're, think that's what he meant. They're always eager to learn. Eager to learn. Great. Okay. Dennis? Well, that was the <laughs> substance of what I wanted to say. We were watching a, a grandchild grow up, their mm -hmm. first grandchild, and uh, it's, it, his horizon expands almost daily. Mm -hmm. His parents show him experiences mm -hmm. that, that he is amazed and, and eager to, to be involved. Mm -hmm. he's, he's eager to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I wonder, may, maybe Jesus was suggesting something along those lines. He's also eager to share every new thing that he has just learned. Absolutely. Which would be good for us. You know, there's th sometimes, though, that there's some grown-ups that still need to grow up. <laughs> oh, dear. So I'm talking about two <laughs> things there, uh -huh. and it's, it's kind of overlapping between, you know, children and grown-ups. Well, know, what's I the most important thing about a child? I don't picture Elijah as being mild and childlike <laughs> and, and Elisha and... and you mean when he called out the bears to tear up those kids? Yeah, and, and you know, we've got to be some room in here first. Well, what's the most important thing about a child? Capacity to grow and learn. His capacity to grow. It says about Jesus, remember the famous verse that you probably memorized, Luke 2.52. Jesus grew both in body, that would be physically, and in wisdom, that would be mentally. Gaining favor with God, that would be spiritually. And people, that would be socially. That's all the ways you can grow, right? If you grow harmoniously in all those things, I mean, think what, would hap what happens if we find a child that doesn't grow physically. We become very alarmed. If he doesn't grow mentally, 
what do we say? Whoa, you know, stop. do something quick, right? If he doesn't go socially, well, we're not real happy about it. We think, well, maybe he'll catch up eventually. But if he doesn't grow spiritually, we say, how sweet. That's great. He's a child, right? Most children have a certain optimism about them. Yeah. And yeah. the younger they are, the more they greet the day, the new day, with enthusiasm. They get up to be teenagers, they get kind of dragging around. <laughs> I had to get up this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Paul tells us that the work of the church is to help people who want to grow, who want to learn, who want to... And the church needs to be set up to help those people. We've, we've talked before in this class. In fact, we, we've done it in our other program, Word Pictures. Leading people through the Bible, book by book, and let them see how the great controversy and how doctrines and how, how teachings and how through personal experiences of the people in the Bible, how they teach lessons about God, and all the time looking for the, the, what's going on behind the scenes. What is God doing in this story? What's the devil doing in this story? As we read along, those are great opportunities to grow. You know, you sure can get distracted, though, from that, those things. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one thing that needs to be done in your evangelism is to show that there is some value in these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And w the important thing to do there is when we read a story about, you mentioned Elijah. We read the story about Elijah. It's not, okay, what can we learn about Elijah? The real question in those stories is, what can we learn about God? If you focus on that question, you'll, you'll find some tough, tough questions in, in some stories. But when you work those things through, you say, man, that, that's fantastic, and you want to move on to the next story. Are you saying it's the church's responsibility to make the Bible come alive mm -hmm. and to make God's character and personality mm -hmm. real? And that would be the total responsibility is to when, when, when focus Jesus, on the yeah. Word of God yeah. and bring it to life. Okay. I find it's fascinating. This book seems like, um, I never thought much of the Bible, but uh, when you start studying it, you realize that it's a supernatural book. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely amazing. I heard an interesting comment in that respect recently. Some people were discussing about how many copies of the Bible are being sold and so forth like this. And, you know, New York Times has a bestseller list and so forth. And he says, why does the Bible ever appear on the New York Times bestseller list? Interesting. It turns out they sell so many more Bibles than any of those other books that they've stopped putting it up there because it just makes all the other, other books look bad. Number one perpetually. Mm -hmm. It would always be number one. Well, you know, there's <laughs> there's a lot of churches that where the uh, preacher does a like a social issue or social mm -hmm. thing, and puts a verse here, takes out a verse here, takes out a verse there, and the person never gets a picture yeah. of a story and what God's doing in the story. Yeah. Well, you know, when Jesus was crucified, the church. Uh, in his day, basically, if you had been there, you would have said, this, this thing is falling apart. There's nothing left. Nothing left but a bunch of discouraged people. They're going to go back to fishing or whatever. It's all over. But then in resurrection morning, things started to happen. And over the next 40 days, Jesus appeared to them several times. Then on the 40th day, after the resurrection, he took them out to the top of the Mount of Olives and maybe just over the edge of the Mount of Olives a little bit and suddenly he just sort of he was gone never to appear physically again the disciples went back to the upper room in Jerusalem and they gathered with about 120 other people and something happened over those next 10 days what do you think happened well let me read the verses and then we can discuss it then the disciples went back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is a, reading I'm reading from Acts 1, starting with verse 12. Then the apostles went back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is about a kilometer away from the city. They entered the city and went up to the room where they were staying. And then it lists all the 12 disciples, uh, the 11 that were left. 
They gathered frequently to pray as a group together with the women, with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. A few days later, there was a meeting of the believers, about 120 in all, and Peter stood up to speak. And the place came unglued. The Holy Spirit came down. And what happened? I mean, here were these, you know, a few weeks before, these discouraged people, you would have said, it's all over, it's all done. And then Peter stands up and preaches, and there's 3,000 people converted in one day. Well, it was a reflection of what Jesus was doing up in heaven. He had uh, received um, the Spirit, the Comforter, that, and sent it to the, uh, to the world. So we can't do that of our own. It wasn't just Peter getting We don't have the Comforter now? Well, I mean, we can't do that without Jesus helping us and without the Spirit helping us. So I we're mean, waiting for Him. Well, it's our duty to ask. Okay. Yeah, it's our duty to ask. And he hasn't sent it like he did back then. Is he waiting to do that? Well, do we have something coming up called the latter rain? That. That's that's right. And waiting um, for us. He's waiting for us. Well, in that room, they were probably very anxious. What do we do? Ring in our hand, ring in their hands, and they wanted to do something. And so he had a bunch of willing cups to fill, yeah. right? And and are we willing cups to fill down here? Yeah. What 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 is us? How many of us is it going to take? Is there a? Hundred forty-four thousand. Is it? Is there, <laughs> you know, I mean, well, we're us. Yeah. Um, is this enough? Uh, or well, it is enough to, and, and, you know, it's not happening because we're not what we ought to be? Or On crucifixion weekend, in the upper room, there were 11 plus a few more. So then evidently there's enough of us here, but we're not what we ought to be. Is that what we're saying here? Well, when they went out And there's a whole room, lot more of us in the yeah. Adventist church, and there's a whole lot more of just Christians than us. I mean, we're one of the largest religions on the planet. Yeah. What, what is us? I, I, we're going to be studying this topic of evangelism for the several more lessons. Mm -hmm. I would challenge each one of us here to bring a reason from the Bible or the spirit of prophecy why we're still here. Mm -hmm. And let's, let's... We've already raised that question several times. We have, but let's, let's take it on formally. Mm -hmm. And everybody find what you really think the Bible or the spirit of prophecy says is the reason. I'll, I'll, I'll give you all a place to look if you want a place to look. <laughs> look at Second Peter 3 and look at Evangelism, page 694 to 697. There it is. Good start. Are we going to do that now? Or are we gonna we're, we're, no, we're, 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 we're giving you that as, and all of you, an assignment. Second Peter 3. Evangelism, the book Evangelism by Ellen White, starting with page 694 through 697, the reason for the delay. But once again, how many is us? Well, I mean, I, obviously I can't, I, I, we know the symbolic number, 144,000. I, I don't, I'm sure that 144,000 in that but case we doesn't say, mean, But we say evidently there aren't enough well, I, I don't you can't come up with a specific yeah. number. There's got to be something there. Okay. You know, when, when we say it, there's got to be some way to come up with an... L l let, me, let me... I've said this many times before, but let me try to say it again, because um, I'm sure some haven't heard it, and, and you can throw this out if you want to. But it looks pretty clear, like the reason Jesus hasn't come yet is because the people who claim to be his people and I'm not talking limiting now to the Adventist church, the people who claim to be his people are not clear enough, and they're not so settled into the truth as he as it says in one place, or Ellen White says, we need to be so settled into the truth both intellectually and spiritually. That is, we understand the truth and we're committed to it that we cannot be moved. So. Jesus says in a lot of those quotations, it just says he can't come back because if he stepped back the time of trouble before he can come back, if God steps back and lets the devil, the devil at us, we would just fall apart. So God needs at least a core group of people who understand the truth 
and they're absolutely committed to it. And I would say especially, they know God well enough so that when the devil comes, they can say, you are not the God of the Bible. Let's suppose I'm one of those core people. Okay. But evidently there's some core missing. Mm -hmm. And then one of these days, I'm not going to be here, I'm going to die off. And in order for me to get to be a core person, it's taken me a while to get there. So now I'm gone. Mm -hmm. So now there's new people coming along, and yes. it's going to take them a while before their core. We've been doing that for 2,000 years now. Well, I know. So <laughs> when are we going to get? Well, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, watch, I watch the garden. I have a garden. I watch it in the summertime. And the plants that you plant, and their roots go deep. Mm -hmm. and, and during the good times, uh, just when the weather's fine, their roots go deep. And then uh, when it's going to be hot, hot, hot in Southern California, um, I will give them a sprinkling during the morning. I'll give them their latter rain. Mm -hmm. And the ones that haven't gotten the deep roots, they wilt during the day. And the others that have got deep roots, they thrive in the hot sun. Mm -hmm. And I think God wants people with deep roots that are going to thrive in the crises. Yeah. And if you don't have deep roots, you're just going to be yeah. one wilted plant. And the, the question is, is that all up to us or is that God's doing? Well, we can't do anything. Without me, ye can do nothing. Mm -hmm. But without the commitment and the willingness to do, nothing well, can happen. That's right. But there's another part to this. Suppose that you have a, two or three of you put together a plan and you start some Bible studies and you convince people that they ought to join the church. What happens if you have a church that you're not so sure you want to invite them to? Well, read them the, the mm -hmm. uh, description of the church in La of the Laodicean church. Mm -hmm. I mean, the last church that is the apple of God's eye is wretched, miserable, poor, naked, and blind. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can find one like that, go sit there. <laughs> Speak up. <laughs> okay. So that, that's what you're going to, in response to Ken's question, so that's what you're going to say. You've got some people, you've persuaded them, and then before you take them to church, now you, you need to realize that these people are Laodicean. And this is a hospital <laughs> for sinners. It's a hospital for sinners. You yeah. go here because of doctrine, not because of the people there. Oh, no, I wouldn't no, say that. I, sure. I, I, no, doctrine is people. People are doctrine. <laughs> Jane Ann. Are we evangelizing, uh, talking about the topic of evangelism, because we want people to learn and become acquainted with God, or because we want big churches? Well, do we want numbers? Yeah. Well, that equals big church. It, it, it depends on who the we is that you're talking about. Some of us want big churches. I want my notch on my belt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I want a bigger church because that's a greater evangelistic tool. Yeah, but I got a big belt. I can put <laughs> a lot of notches on No. The, 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 the truth is that there's only, the only thing that really matters is telling the truth about God. It's only that issue. The good news is never about us. It's always about God. And we need to figure out ways to say that more effectively. So it isn't that all those baptisms, isn't that good news? To yeah. get all excited about? Yeah. Well, you know, even no? <laughs> if the people don't come to our church and they're not uh, involved in our church, um, just the fact that they know about God may help get them through the end times. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the most important thing, is they know who God is. Are there programs in your church that you would be excited to have people join? Maybe even before they become members? Why is it that we, we put on expensive programs and we, we worldwide television programs and we get thousands of people to be baptized and many of them come in the front door, they stay a short time and they go out the proverbial back door? But, you know, sometimes they go out the back door and go to another church. 
you know, it's just a process in growing the plant. So well, I, we're not I trying to convince people to go to other churches. Well, but I, I don't <laughs> like people to kick themselves when a person leaves because they have learned a lot. They have to go and think about it. They may watch a TV program. Then they'll go to another church. It's not an instantaneous. They're going to have an evangelistic series, join the church and stay there forever. Well, one of the problems is this. <laughs> Ellen White says, in laboring where there are already some in the faith, the minister should at first seek not so much to convert unbelievers as to train the church members for acceptable cooperation. Let him labor for them individually, endeavoring to arouse them to seek for a deeper experience themselves and to work for others. When they are prepared to sustain the minister by their prayers and labors, greater success will attend his efforts. Nothing lasting can be accomplished for churches in different places unless they are aroused to feel that a responsibility rests upon them. Every member of the body should feel that the salvation of his own soul depends upon his own individual effort. Souls cannot be saved without exertion. The minister cannot save the people. He can be a channel to which God will impart light to his people, but after the light is given, it is left with the people to appropriate that light and in their turn, to let it shine forth to others. That's Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 121. It's also in Gospel Workers, page 196. We'll have to bring that one again as one of the, one of the yeah. reasons. Well, here's the question that we're running out of time, so let me just sort of wind things down here. <clears throat> have you ever been trained by your church to witness or to be part of an evangelistic team? Um, it's pretty obvious that a church that's squabbling over this or that or the other issue is probably not focused on evangelism. So if we were focused on evangelism, we were all out there really with a common goal of reaching out to others, most of the squabbling would probably stop. Um, have you ever been a part of a church that was focused on evangelism? It's a very exciting thing. And what about the Holy Spirit? Do you think he would delay helping out in churches that were really focused on evangelism. There are many promises in the Bible about what God will do. I don't think we have to worry about His part. So how about it? Are we preparing to, preparing to make evangelism witnessing among our top priorities? Those of us who believe in the great controversy, trust healing model of the plan of salvation believe that just becoming a member of the church is not enough. That is only the first step. We need to make mem take members through the Bible book by book and show them how the great controversy spread out through the, the, chapter, the, the chapters of the scriptures. And we're running out of time, so I'm going to challenge you to stick with us next week. We'll talk more.